So in keeping with the limited uh, introductions, here's Damien Fair. Okay, I'll, I'll try to get through this quickly to make sure we stay on time. Um, I'd like to start off with just with the acknowledgments here. Just um, a lot of the work that we, we will talk about, that I'll talk about today has been conducted by lots of folks, a lot of close collaborations of, uh, with Joe Nigg, Tassiana Costadia as a postdoc, Katie Gates, Sarah, Sarah Carolinas, lots of folks that you can see, it takes pretty much an army to, to conduct a lot of the types of work that we do that kind of spans across um, the clinical realm and all the way up to the, to the neuroscience. So uh, lots of thanks to, lot, to the folks who've been, you know, been assisting with all this work. Okay, so there are two main goals that I'd like to talk about today. One, um, I want to, uh, I'll discuss what I like to call the heterogeneity problem and, 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 and briefly gloss over graph theories, and Steve such a, did such an excellent job about describing that. And then I'll describe a bit about how we might inform heterogeneity in samples via, via uh, graph, theory, graph theory methodology. Now, I'm noticing in the audience, um, a lot of people I've seen over the last couple months where I've given this talk, so I, I apologize if there's any redundancy here. Okay, so a question. So what, there's one goal when examining complex behaviors or brain physiology in early youth is to determine whether this information can directly or directly associates with developmental trajectories or mental health issues now or later in life. In other words, can information from non-invasive tools psychiatric diagnoses, uh, brain imaging, behavioral testing, et cetera, at a given developmental stage assist in predicting future outcomes. Can this information help us tailor, tailor earlier interventions and future therapeutics to improve health outcomes for an, a given individual? Well, when we typically start this enterprise and begin to answer these questions, and our lab is no different, we often start at, these, uh, at the group level, where we take one group defined by some um, some types of some type of external features and, and compare it to another group to identify what's different in this group versus the other. We'd like to study we study ADHD amongst among other things, and so typically we use um, um, the DSM or some other diagnostic criteria to define define our particular groups. Now there are a couple of assumptions of this of this particular model that deserve questions. So one is this model largely relies on the assumption that our current clinical diagnostic categories represent these etiological homogeneous syndromes, right? It might, might be that instead, you know, there may be, for a particular ADHD phenotype, there may be multiple mechanistic subgroups that exist that demonstrate that, that particular phenotype. The other is that the model also largely presumes that the control population represents one big homogeneous group, right? Just as there may be multiple different profiles and in a given ADHD population, there may also be uh, heterogeneity even within the organization of typically developing populations, right? Now, in the case of ADHD, the idea or the questioning of the assumption of homogeneity in samples is not a new one. There's been many theoretical papers out there for many years that have described, uh, that have described this, the, the potential of this problem. But although it's easy to propose conceptually that there must be distinct subgroups within these mental disorders or typical developing populations, empirically demonstrating those subgroups is not very straightforward. Okay, it can be very difficult. And here's one of the reasons why. So if you go back to your institution, you start your new study, and you have your humongous sample of three participants, it can be pretty easy, where there's only two possible ways that you can subgroup that population. As soon as you get up to 10 people in your, in your, in your big data, you're now up to 21,000 different ways that you can potentially subgroup that population. By the time you're up to 15 people in your, in your, in your study, your big data study, you're now up to over a billion ways you can, you can subgroup that population. And now that, you, now that you've hit the, hit the jackpot, you now you have 20 people in your, in your sample, now you can, there's, more than, there's more than a trillion ways that you can subdivide, subdivide that population. So this is a difficult problem. Now, there's lots of folks in here have undoubtedly come across many different ways that people have hypothesized, or not hypothesized, but applied different measures to kind of subgroup populations. So things like hierarchical clustering or k-means clustering, latent class analysis, finite fixture models, et cetera, 
have all been used or have been have thought of it being used to, for for this enterprise. Um, for us, for for me, what we've been attempting is to is to use graphene, specifically community detection, the same methodology that Steve was just talking about in the prior talk, um, for this to 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 attack this problem. So. Some of the, just a couple of the reasons why we like it is that it's data-driven, doesn't require a priori, knowledge, a priori knowledge of the number of groups, and there's some ways that you can, there's ways that, some markers that test well how valid these subgroups actually are. But regardless of what you decide to use or what you want to use to be able to identify these subpopulations, a couple of things that I always like to start off with, you have to think about, there are many valid ways that you can subdivide populations. And it largely depends, on how useful those are largely depends on your question, right? So <clears throat> how those subgroups subdivide large, will also largely depend on the algorithms you use and the types of features that you input. So you really have to think about um, and really have to cogitate about how, what, what types of me measurements you think will be most informative for the question that you're asking. But regardless, no matter what you do, there has to be some type of external, given, uh, external validation of a given demarcation, um, how predictive it is, how well it helps with therapeutic responses, et cetera. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be applying um, these gra graph theory analyses towards this, towards this problem. I'm not going to go over that, go over this again, besides just pointing out that, again, what, graph theory, what we're doing with graph theory is taking a, um, it's about networks where we take a collection of nodes that are, that are linked by lines or edges. Now, there are, are lots of different measurements that we can use to describe the, a, ne a given network structure, right? Things like degree and path link, clustering coefficient, things that describe some things like small world systems, rich club that some folks in here probably heard me talk about. There's lots of different measurements that, we're, that can be used. What we're going to be, without, what we're using is, is for this, to tag this problem is the, is the idea of community detection or, or, or modules where you can identify specific um, clusters of nodes in the brain that, have, that share many more, many more links relative to, other, relative to other nodes or other clusters of nodes in the system. Now, as Steve was pointing out earlier, how this has been applied in our literature more recently has been by taking our brain regions here um, as nodes and then this functional connectivity business here as our edges, right? But now we're going to flip that a little bit and now instead of our nodes being brain regions, our nodes are actually going to be our participants and the edges are actually going to be the relationships of these participants across some person-centered features. So um, in this cartoon, this is a, across a bunch of different uh, behavioral phenomena in, in, in the, across the participants. And the idea, of course, then is can we identify subpopulations in our, in our groups that are informative with regard to the disorder? Okay, so on to goal number two, informing heterogeneity samples via graph theory. Now our first look into this, um, um, this enterprise was uh, briefly discussed by Mike earlier in, in, in some of the talk, but it was not with imaging at all. It was specifically looking at behavior where we had a very large sample of participants, um, nearly 500 participants from ages 7 to 12 who came into, this, came into the study and, and um, conducted near over, you know, 20 neuropsychological, neuro, the various types of neuro, neuropsychological measures. We started by doing some, some natural features reduction be a confirmatory factor analysis where we could break down all those psychological measures into seven specific domains. Inhibition, working memory, um, arousal or activation, um, response variability, temporal information processing, memory span, and, and, and processing speed. So from there, across all the different participants, what we did is we, we, we simply did a, a correlation of their scores across every participant so we could see how similar one participant was across all these measures versus another participant. And that just generates a nice little matrix of where some folks are really closely similar and some folks aren't similar, are not similar at all, okay? We can apply our community detection algorithms to then to identify A, whether subgroups come out and uh, whether they exist at all and, and B, what those are. So this is the first result of this particular analysis. Here, we applied this on the ADHD samples, and we were feeling very good after we, after we saw this because the, the, the groups came out very robustly, and they were um, very, very interesting and fit with a lot of the theories that relate to ADHD. 
we found a group here now, and this particular graph here, up means poor performance. So this per what we found was we found several groups. We found like one group that relative to their peers seemed to be really atypical in response variability, something that Javier has actually talked a lot about over the last 10 years or so. We found other groups that were very, very atypical in, in other measurements like um, executive function and things like that. We found other groups that were atypical in arousal and so on. And so this is very interesting because it told us that that these um, that in the ADHD sample there was they weren't all just atypical in all these different measurements, but they actually there were actually some something distinct, something unique about different subpopulations. But then, before submitting our Nature paper and becoming really famous and and uh, and, ex and, and you know exciting the world, we decided to look at the control population. And what we found was that what we found was that there were subgroups in the control population as well. And not only that, but they were quite similar to what we saw in the ADHD population. We saw a group relative to their peers that was atypical in response variability, a group relative to their peers that was atypical in these executive functions, a group relative to their peers that were atypical in arousal. And so this was very self-defeating at first because it was hard to really think about until we started thinking, well, maybe that some of our assumptions with regard to the typical, just the general typical population aren't right. Maybe there are different subpopulations even within, even within our typically developing control group, right? And that the ADHD population is just is a subset of this normal, normal variation. And if that's true, then if we, if we look at if we compare our ADHD population our, to the same, to the folks that are in the same profile in our control population, maybe that will give us some more information about ADHD. Now, if you look at the, of these particular measurements in ADHD versus control, if you keep everybody together, of course, what they, what they look like is that all the ADHD kids are worse and across all these measures. This isn't something new. This has been reported many times. But if you look within the profiles, what we identified was that not all the ADHD kids were really atypical in all these measures, but that, that depending on the profile, they were only atypical in a very select few. And so this is just a small example, uh, just a small example of that. But of course, I'm a neuroimager, and I was asked to talk about neuroimaging. So the question, of course, that was immediately um, crossed our mind was, well, can similar phenomena be demonstrated via functional imaging? So now, instead of our edges being the similar similarities across these behavioral domains, now our, our edges are similarities across imaging features, in this case, the, the, this functional connectivity. Now, we started with this model from uh, Nora Volkow, who um, studies addiction, but it's, the model you know, mimics or shares a lot of features with lots of the models that study ADHD, and it's a good illustration of what we'd like to talk about. Tatiana Cosadias, the postdoc in the lab, was the one who, who, who began this work. And the model, what these models suggest is that there's this ratio of, there's this ratio of links between cortical and subcortical connections that lead to normative behavior in the case of uh, enticing stimulus, you know, impulsive, impulse control. And that when, the, when this ratio becomes, be, becomes, goes awry, that can lead to atypical responses or impulse-like impulse -like responses, some similar things that we see in the kids with ADHD. Now, what's important about this model is that is a couple of things. You, you might get the same exact phenotype out here if one kid has this particular circuit that's atypical, right? Or you might, or in another kid, you might have this circuit may be perfectly normal, but you might have this circuit be atypical. And the phenotype, the output, would be exactly the same, right? Now, <clears throat> so what Tashiana set out to do was, well, is, is there, differences in these atypical, in these different distributions of atypical circuits that lead to similar, similar phenotypes. Um, and B, is there different distributions even in the control population that can, that can lead to normative behavior, you know, uh, phenotypes? So she started with, she started here with the uh, nucleus accumbens as her, as the, as the seed region, where you can get connectivity maps across all, all the different participants compare, just like we did with the behavior, compare the connectivity maps for every person to every other person, apply your community detection. This was on um, this initial, you know, study into this. 
was on this 115 participants, and we, when we did it, we got three different, three, different, three different clusters that were distributed between controls and ADHD uh, in this way. Now, um, this is the, so this is, the, this is, our, this is the, the profile of our first group. And you see with the connectivity with this nucleus accumbens, what you see is patterns that are a lot of you have seen, a lot of you have seen in the, um, throughout the literature where you see connectivity with the default system, negative connectivity with the frontal parietal systems and other, t other attention systems. Here's the ADHD group, and here's where, here's where the groups differed um, for, this particular, for this particular subgroup. And what, the, what kind of popped out of, at us immediately was the, the overlap with what, what folks would call the default system. Here's the second group. Now, what you can see in the profile here is that the connectivity with the default system is largely quite different than the, orig than the original group. And there's lots of connectivity here with these frontal parietal systems. If you look at the difference between the controls and ADHD, you get a, a, a different profile than the, than the first one. And if you look at this, this last group, what you see is even yet another profile where, again, the connectivity of the default system is, is quite a bit less. You get the connectivity now with instead of the frontal parietal system, it's the singular percular system that fo many folks have, have heard of. And if you look at the difference, you see lots of the differences that you see between controls and ADHD lie in these domains. And this is just, just to kind of push this point, this is just a, a quick picture looking at the, these networks as defined by, based on that work that, that, that um, uh, Steve was just talking about. In, in, you see that different systems appear to be affected in ADHD. This is the differences here. Different systems be affected. This one is large, again largely default, and this group over here is largely seems to be related to the singular per, singular percular system. And so, what the data so far is beginning to suggest is that is that a portion of the variation observed in functional connectivity across typical developing populations is better than in these discrete communities, and that the data also suggests that the heterogeneity in individuals with ADHD appears to be nested in this normal variation. And that it may be that identifying mechanisms associated with mental disorders, such as ADSD, requires comparing individuals to well-adjusted persons within the same cognitive style or profile. But back to the question. So can information from these non-invasive non tools, the brain imaging, behavioral assessments, et cetera, get at a given developmental stage assist in predicting future outcomes? And so as a follow-up on this work, uh, a postdoc in, the, in Joel Nick's lab is decided to take this up by using, she's a clinical psychologist, and started to use more clinically applicable measures, things that you can apply right in the clinic. And so she took this temperament and middle childhood questionnaire that, they, that is developed by Mary Rothbard and, and um, uh, Posner down just south of us at Eugene, um, to look at temperament styles and see if they exist in these populations, see how that can, might be informative towards ADHD. Now I'm gonna focus on the ADHD group here when she, when she applied this, she found, three different, she found three different groups, an uncomplicated, what she called an uncomplicated group, a surgeon group, and a negative emotion group, and I'll describe why, those, why she called them that in just a second. Here are, here's the uh, a summation of these temperament scores. The uncomplicated group was atypical in attention, as you, as you would expect um, for kids who have ADHD, but this is, and that's in blue here, but across all these other domains, they were relatively, they were relatively normal. The few other groups, however, had distinct profiles, where you have one, one group seemed to be really atypical with regard to things like anger, discomfort, the ability to be soothed, openness, affiliation, things of this nature. And the other group was atypical in other things, where they were very, they were very assertive, high, high, you know, high pleasure seeking, and, and, things, and, and things like this. And I'm gonna focus largely on this group, but, but there's lots of data that suggests these guys are, slightly, are um, highly different. In the imaging, what, we, what, what she was able to identify at, this, at the initial time point was that there was lots of atypical connectivity with some of these nodes that, have been, that, that, that Steve had noted as being these crossover, these crossover nodes like this one here in the, in the um, anterior insula, which has this um, high participation coefficient. But <clears throat> the real piece here that we think is very important is that if you looked at these kids one year later, this negative emotion group, what they, what they had was 50, nearly 50% of these kids went on to have another, another new onset disorder, meaning there's some type of course deterioration that couldn't be identified at all depending using current ADHD symptoms and diagnosis, um, which we think is, is, is really shows how important um, identifying these heterogeneity samples really is. So 
Can information from non-invasive tools like brain imaging assist in developing more predictive future outcomes? Can we use it to, to tailor in early interventions? Well, it's still a work in progress, but uh, characterizing the he this heterogeneity in typical and atypical populations at all ages is likely going to be a major component that will have to be improved before we're able to realize uh, the full potential. I'll end there, and thank you.